what division will I get in my next board examination? Or will I will I have my own bicycle? Those days, you know, for a ch child, a bicycle owning was very good, and it was left at that. And in the year 1958, I went to Nanital, where he had uh, an ashram, and they were consecrating a Shiva temple. So I went with my uncle, uh, you know, I went to in fact visit my uncle and have some fun at the hillside in the hill station. But my uncle, who was a devotee of Babaji, started telling me about uh, all that he was and what greatness. Initially, I was not frankly very interested because I was a young man of 17 and a half years. I wanted to have some fun going to the hills, going with the crowd dancing at the platform they play band in the evening but something also i started getting interested and in india you know you 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 don't play around with your uncle and say no no i won't do it so i went with him and then 15 days he took me to the temple and maharaj he was out out of the you know uh, nanitar at that time so he took me to the temple i started going in the morning arti evening arti and one fine afternoon, we were told that he has arrived. You know, Babaji used to be addressed as Maharajji. Maharaj is a big king. That is an address either you give to a king or you give to a sadhu, a very celebrated sadhu. So, I went to see him and then the moment I went to see him, I was introduced by uncle. Maharaj, he is my nephew. So, I kind of pranamed the Indian custom and then I wanted to kind of go away and get some fun at the city but I went down to the you know the gate of the temple which was down a slide it is a hill station so about a furlong or two or maybe three furlongs and I couldn't cross the gate which led to the road and out to the city well I came up again and hung around I started kind of liking the life around that place I started participating I started uh, you know, a lot of things were being cooked, so I, I got across him and I started doing work. But yet, you know, whenever I go to look at him, I was curious also. So when I went to look at him, I found that he would look at me. The moment I was our eyes locked, he would avoid it. So it was kind of a, you know, just a child getting inquisitive and then he's not getting any, uh, you know, kind of encouragement from him. Neither he would talk, but just our eyes would lock and shift his gauge. So the evening, all people started going. So I asked my uncle, can I go? Uncle said, has he asked you to go? I said, no, he has not asked me. He said, stay put. The next day, my aunt, uh, aunt my, uh, his wife brought my change. I changed and then started working. So the first day and the second day and the third day, I'm stuck to him. I sleep there, cook the food, you know, participate in the activities there. But yet, I was not very happy that what am I doing here why am I not having fun going out but something or other I just won't leave him and the third evening a palanquin you know where you carry a person the people carry on your shoulders and then take you away they probably they call it palanquin so he went in a palanquin to a devotee's house and uh, where I got the first good you know, big meal, you know, lots of delicacies eating, etc. I ate a good meal and slowly slipped into the drawing room and tucked my feet under, a, you know, on a, on a couch and slept. So at four o'clock, the Indian custom, all those mothers, we, we call females in mothers in India, they came. Then they started doing his arti, waving a wick in front of the Lord. And uh, I was, you know, kind of a curious just looking at it, now they woke me up. He said, get up Maharaji's Aarti. Then I also waved to Aarti in front of him and sat down at a distance of about six to seven feet. Then when the Aarti finished, he called me up and he says, this boy said that either Maharaji is not letting me go nor he's talking to me. And he kind of patted me hair like this. That was the pat and I just wept unashamedly. Tears started dripping my eyes and as if you know all the incantations, all the prayers, all the philosophies of anything said anywhere in any religion, thus they just got embedded into that pattern entered me. And believe me, after that I have not seen two gods. I have never had a 
doubt in my life that who to follow, what to follow, what to do, and my life has been uninterrupted because of it. Is that pat on my head, and I have only one Lord. I have travelled places, I have gone places, I have gone to temples, I have gone to mosques, I have gone to synagogues, I have gone to many many places, but everywhere he, I just carried him with me, or he followed me, whatever way you want to put it. And this is how the life has been with him. Then I started seeing the divine in him. I got glued to that place for almost about maybe 30 days, and I served. There was a temple consecration. I totally participated with full gusto. I became a very active worker, and I started. I also started feeling the spark of divine in him. I only wanted that he's one in my life, and he's one God, one Lord, one Guru, whatever. He's only one for me. And I got, and I kind of got welded to him. I got just uh, married to him, spiritually. Then, as he was parting after about a month's stay, I remember it was probably 27th of June, 1958. Then I asked him, Maharaj, where do I see you? He says, you come to Sudhir Mukherjee's place, four church in Allahabad. Someday your whole family will come to me. Well, I just came back and I came to Allahabad, told my father, told my mother. I had incidentally failed in my examination, so I was not a very welcome person with all this spiritual blah, blah, blah. So, uh, my father told to stay away, concentrate on my studies. Then, however, I found out where was Mr. Mukherjee. I started, you know, when I went to his house, I said, has Maharaj come? He says, who is Maharaj? They used to call him Baba. I said, uh, I took his name. You don't take Guru's name, you know, in, in Indian custom. But I took his Maharaj's name. And then he said, uh, no, he has not come. Then, you know, every third day I would go and inquire, has Baba come? Has Baba come? One day, probably he got annoyed and said, you don't have to come every day. When Baba comes, you'll come to know it yourself. And that was the first time I felt crestfallen. And I came back home. In the morning, I saw a dream that I am going to Mukherjee's, Mr. Mukherjee's house, Sudhir Mukherjee's house, and I found that I'm entering, I'm, I am entering. I saw that I am entering the gate. I parked my cycle, opened the door of the. I had not gone beyond the door any time. Open the door. I see a gallery. I see Babaji Maharaji coming to that gallery, and I am meeting him at the flight of the stair. I travel some distance. He comes forward some distance and I put my head at his feet and I weep. I got emotional and I wept. After that, I just woke up and with it, you know, I started getting prepared. I had my bath. Mother said, where are you going? It was almost about 6 in the morning, maybe 5.30. So I said, I'm going to uh, Mukherjee Sahib's house because Maharaj has come. She asked, how do you know? But how do I tell them I'm trusting my dream? So now I, anyway, I picked up my bicycle. By the time I already had a bicycle, went to Mukherjee, Mr. Mukherjee's place, opened the door, checked in, kept my bike. There was a door which was slightly open. I walked in. I found he was coming from the same place. I met him at the flight of the stair and I kept my head and wept. After that, I became a total assistant man, associate man at Mukherjee's house. Mr. Mukherjee, I got my first spiritual anchoring, my training at his feet. I would not go to my university whenever Maharajji came to Allahabad. I just kept my, you know, uh, diaries under any place and then I would serve him. And I would sleep at the gallery. I would not go back home. The moment he came to the, veranda, uh, to the drawing room where he sat and gave his darshan, I would go there and talk to him. You know, in the year 1958, the same year, when it was in, in the winter, maybe December, our uh, dear mother, who we know as Siddhima in the, in the, you know, our ashram heritage, she came to Allahabad and I just got across her and I, you know, kind of thought that, like, I was convinced that I had met my another mother. My real mother is, of course, my biological mother, but I met my mother and I just saw the oneness in in my faith of uh, Maharajji to Ma. And well, this lasts uh, almost about 58 years. I have grown with Maharajji. I served Maharajji for 13, 14, 15 years. 
when he left his body i became a servant to mother but in all the activities i have always grown at the feet of my guru there is not ever a single moment that i have parted when he was there i saw those miracles happening when he is not in his body i am seeing this miracle happening if you want to ask any specific question i'll be more than glad to describe it so <clears throat> How do you feel Maharaji with you now, um, this trip to the United States? Um, how do you carry him with you? How is he guiding your experience? Look, I'll tell you, when I came, uh, when Ramdas, Dr. Richard Elpert, I call him Baba Ramdas because he's a Baba to me. When he came to India in 1978, we had already consecrated first temple of Maharaji at Kenchi. I had personally involved myself into making that murti with mother's, our Siddhi Ma's uh, instructions. We made that murti, brought it to India, consecrated it. It was a fabulous experience. You know, I saw in my dream that this is how the consecration will be done. And when I woke up, I found that I had quite convincingly, you know, the, the realization that this is how it is going to happen. And for 15, 17 days during that consecration ceremony, I saw everything that I had seen in my dream. They are very personal dreams, I'll keep them to myself. But then when Ramdas came that, uh, you know, the next year, he said, who has gotten this Murti made? So someone said that, my name is Rabbu. Rabbu was, uh, you know, he was instrumental in getting this Murti process. So he said that, I would like to make a Hanman Murti. So that Hanman Murti, he brought a, uh, Baba Ramdas brought a, a sketch. Uh, probably, uh, you know, it was made by one Lakshmi Tiernan and that concept was developed, we got a replica made, then we got it processed and ultimately that Hanmanji was uh, finally made. You know, when we bought that marble rock, we started processing slowly and slowly that, you know, it was a unique concept of a flying Hanman, the one that really flew at the time of Ram and this is the second Hanman that has flown to, you, you know, your Taos. So we agreed on feet, we agreed on calf, we agreed on, uh, you know, waist and chest. That face was somehow other not getting reconciled. So Ramdas kept on writing to me, I kept on going. And ultimately I said, now look, let Hanuman decide how would he like to look. So Ramdas kind of must have laughed and sent me a letter, it's okay. Then I brought Siddhima from Kenshi and uh, we worked for about four days and you see the temple which is here. When the Murti came here, after that, 2007, I followed it. I came to Taos, stayed for five, six years, and uh, five, five, six days, and got the murti, whole murti, you know. I attended the Bhandara. Again, to repeat that, I have come here in 2015. My main reason of coming to U.S. this time is, I have come for a 40-day, I will call it pilgrimage, or meeting devotees all around U.S. I started with uh, New Jersey, then I came to Long Island, stayed with Rameshwar Das, then went to San Francisco, stayed with Marilyn Prano, met all the people, uh, the devotees of uh, San Francisco. We had a kind of a small workshop that I sang, we, I spoke about Maharaji, about his leelas. From there on I went to Hawaii, stayed four glorious days with Ramdas in Maui. And from here I have come here. I've come here, I, they were kind enough to invite me in a board meeting. We exchanged suggestions. Now we finally decide that they are going to have a temple specially, uh, specifically, specially constructed for Lord Hanuman. And uh, well, this is how I have come and carried forward. And I, I sincerely wish, sincerely trust that uh, all the devotees of Maharaji around U.S. will totally, by heart, by emotions, by body, by any way, they'll contribute and see that the completion is done of the murti, of the temple. And when I come back again, I'll specifically come to attend the consecration ceremony of the temple. I promise I'll come with my wife and I'll wear this. Now, as far as going to, you know, my Maharaj post Maharaj and after Maharaj, these 57 years has been with Maharaj every time. There's not a single moment that he does not stay with me. I have gone to the churches, I have gone to the mosque, I have gone to the temples, I have gone to all the religious places. Wherever I go, I find Maharaj giving me 
his darshan, his perception, his concept in that murti also I see. I've been to Vatican, I've been to Domo, I've been to Florence, I've been to St. Paul's Cathedral, name a thing. I've been to uh, Cologne, I've been to White Church, I've been to Church of Notre Dame, I've been to mosque, many, many places. But there is, you know, when Guru chooses you as a servant, then he does not let any doubt in your mind remain that he is the master. He arranges your rendezvous with divine and ultimately you realize that what you are seeking is not guru but the divine and the divine is your guru. This is a very typical concept in, with, with the Indian conceptual, you know, spiritual, spirituality. You know, the Guru is Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Deva Maheshwara. The Guru is Lord Shiva, the Guru is Lord Vishnu, Guru is Lord uh, Brahma. And when he knows, when you know Guru, then all these three, you call it Holy Trinity in your Christianity, Father, Son and the Holy Ghost. You say Brahma, Vishnu, Mahesh in the Indian, uh, this thing. These all trinities you see are totally merged and immersed in your Guru. And that Guru ultimately gives you that vision that there is no one other than Him. Which you see, I am in Taos, I am I'm, I'm, as if I feel that I am everywhere. When I go out of Taos, I will feel that the Guru is following me. He, guru doesn't follow me, I carry Him with me. And wherever I go, I have not felt this. Right now also, I am full of Guru. You are talking to me about it. I am not thinking in terms of He left His body in 1973. He is right now here. In the temple, around the temple, with me, with you, we are speaking to him. Thank you. Um, so, you, can you tell us a little bit about some of the miracles then that you witnessed and and how how it's possible, how you can believe them? Look, uh, in Indian mythology, uh, when you talk about a Baba and give him the status of divine itself, it is not the miracle, you don't call them miracles, you call them Leela. Because it flows out of them. When the divine is present, whatever happens is his creation that flow out of his body, you know. When we say about Indian, uh, in Indian mythology, you say, you don't say Krishna's miracles, you say Krishna Leela. You don't say Ram's miracle, you say Ram Leela. So, when a saint is divine, you know, it's a different concept in our Indian mythology. So, whatever flows out of him is all the forces of universe are at his command and they help him out to perform the desired effect of whatever he wants to produce by only wishing it, only wishing it. He just wills it and wishes it, it happens. This is what I have felt all my life whenever Baba, whenever he was around, things would miraculously appear. I'll give you my personal case, you know, when I got married, I went, in fact, I went to tell my mother that I will not get married. So. Mother was wanting me to get married. I was already nearing, nearing 30. So as when to tell her, know that I still can't support my family, Babaji, all of a sudden, Maharajji came to our house and called me. He said, how can you say no? I have had that girl's marriage for four years. She's the girl for you. I will kind of say that, sir, but then how am I going to feed her? How am I going to support her? I don't have that much of income. So he says, who are you to support her? It is I who will do it. It is the God who will do it. Then anyway, I agreed and he made my uncle send a telegram that uh, go and confirm to that girl's father. He's a devotee of Hanuman. He'll, he, that he'll do a big feast. He'll, he'll distribute laddus when his daughter gets married. So, you know, somehow or other the marriage came and it was decided that it will be held on the 8th March 1970. In India, you know, a bride party, a groom party goes to bride party. They go to the bride's place and get married on a certain date. So he said, how are you going? I said, sir, the distance is about 
500 kilometers, so we'll have to travel by bus. He said, no, you don't go by bus. You will all die. You'll have an accident. I said, no, I have already arranged the bus. I stuck to my ground because I had already paid the advance. I had already made the route. I had already made the reservation to, you know, kind of feed the barat, the, the, the marriage party on the way. He said, when are you going? I said, we go on the seventh morning, reach in the evening, get married on the eighth and come back. He said, no, you go by train. Then some other, <laughs> foolishly, I, 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 I was adamant. I said, no, sir, we'll go. Then he said, okay, if you are going by train, a bus, change your route. Don't go directly to Allahabad, uh, to Merat. Which a, it's a distance of 500 kilometers where I was, my parents were staying. So I said, how can we do that? This will be difficult. He said, now go via Lucknow, go a day early, go on the 6th, reach on the 7th, stay at Lucknow on the 6th, get married, come back, stay for another day. He made a long route of about five days, which was inconvenient and this, but some other, I agreed. I went to Lucknow. Miraculously, I got a place for the whole, a whole floor of a, a, a guest house uh, for the uh, marriage party to stay overnight for about, uh, you know, with a, for about for about for about 39 people so okay we said yes then he said you must leave your house by about 150 but not later than two o'clock in the afternoon you know but there was nothing to you know after to, to avoid I said okay sir we went so we left on the 6th March 1970 at 150 I remember the day in the afternoon and in the evening at 520 our bus carrying 39 people turned turtle three times and it turned so bad that it was at quite a speed then you know it turned three times and then when it fell, finally stopped the all windows shattered in they broke in and the driver's window which is a big one became a getaway door because it turned like this you know sideways so I went through that uh, we all went through that and I asked my uncle what is the casualty? So there were two people missing. So we went in again. I found my cousin brother was uh, lying on the floor. His neck, uh, his, his waist was little hurt. We pulled him out. Then there was one daughter of ours who was missing, Mukta. Then when he went in, we found that she was stuck under, a, you know, a, a, a stuck uh, trunk you call it a suitcase or truck. It was a trunk, seat trunk and she was st stuck inside. She was lying on the floor. We pulled her out. She came out smiling. So when we went, ultimately we took another bus. That bus was absolutely unserviceable. We went to Lucknow. No bus, no person would take it. Ultimately we had to go by train. And we <laughs> left by train, went to Merat, got married, came back on the 10th. Meanwhile, someone told my mother that there was a big accident and the casualties are not known. Everyone who had come to stay at our house for the wedding celebration started asking my mother. My mother said, look, if anything bad has happened, it has happened to my son. Otherwise, nothing will go wrong. So whatever she did, she wanted to meet Maharaj. She went to Mr. Mukherjee's place with a prasad in her hand and found Maharaj had already gone, left Allahabad the previous evening. Well, we she went to Siddhima with her another, uh, you know, another mother, Jivantima, and told all the story. So mother said, look, we can only pray to Maharaj, but nothing will happen to the Bharat. Everything will be safe by his grace, by Maharaj's grace. So she left the prasad, but she had taken, prasad are eatables, you know, we call them prasad. So she said, left the prasad at, at that place and came back home, very morose, sad, and, you know, not what, what not to say, you know. She did not have any words to tell the people that, to console them that they, they had their sons and their kids in the marriage party. So after some time, a very weak, melodious voice was heard saying that, I am very hungry, can someone give me some food to eat? So Siddhima suddenly remembered and said, Rabu's mother has left that feast, give it to him to eat, that sadhu, Eight, he was very old, mother had a GGP from outside, free from the house and very old. He ate that prasad and ultimately said, whosoever has given this prasad, nothing bad will come to him. 
and by the time mother could get alert she has suddenly disappeared and she sent a servant to you know as uh, to search for him he was not found then she sent message to my mother my mother said you know guaranteed on maharaj's behalf that nothing will happen go anyway to we went uh, limping to the marriage got married i came back with my bride and we had to come by ultimately train so on the 10th of march when we you know reached the elavad railway station i found that maharaj we 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 came to know that maharaj ji had come the previous evening and he has sent his jeep to us to be received and he was very excited that my son is coming my daughter in law is coming my son is coming they call it bahu my daughter in law is coming he was very excited in pacing the veranda at mukherjee sahab's place so my parents said my uh, elder said that let's take the bride home first customary it is customary i said nahi i am going to the one who has saved my life and i went with my wife i entered the premises and you know i remember my senses till the time i reached the gate then the emotion started welling up i fell at his feet and started crying sadly badly and you know i was kind of i was so emotional and hysterical my wife looked at me as if she had married a cry baby she married a cry boy then mara said you have put me into so much a problem i had to do so much to save your life why do you have to do that you know then he gave a sari to my wife that you know that sari was <laughs> saved by my wife it was saved by my wife then she went to tell the first child she was wearing the sari the child almost survived an impossible you know birth my wife fell sick my child fell sick this is a huge story i can only say that i have described all the miracles that were in my life or leelas that maharaj played in my life a little siddhima played in my life in a book that i have written i and my father are one authored by rabbu joshi i don't want to promote this book but that has miracles leelas whatever you say endless you know when the divine is incarnated in a human body he just does things for the sake of humanity for the welfare of the mankind and that is what maharaj is that is what it is and my sole purpose of coming here this time is uh, in two days to meet all my guru bhais around tell them that there is a hanuman temple they should really do well and i have come to attend this bhandara to give my assistance or whatever it is anything else you would like to ask me i'll be more than glad to tell you the more there my life endless is a miracle it is a unceasing they are still happening there is no moment which is without maharaj ji that is what is spirit if the like you say the spirit of jesus well he was crucified 2000 years ago i went to once jerusalem i went to once sea of galilee it was about 15 years ago so when i went to sea of galilee there is a plaque saying that here the john the baptist uh, uh, you know baptized jesus of nazareth i prayed can i can i get the glimpse of the time when jesus was really uh, you know baptized by john the baptist so i i got a, you know i felt light in my head but nothing you know sparkling so what happened later on there's a platform uh, in in that sea of galilee uh, on the river and there's also a cliff so i found that there was a team from Uh, Vatican, where John the Baptist was was, be, was being played by one person, and the Jesus was, you know, the character of Jesus was being played by another person, and when they, it was such a melodious, you know, dialogue between those two, I started weeping, and I got real spirit of Jesus. How do you account for that? Is not Jesus a living spirit? I went to Bethlehem. I went to see. I went to Jerusalem. I started walking down those 22 places where Jesus fell with his plough on his shoulders, and I kind of got emotional when I went to the you know place where Jesus on a cross. All my emotions welled up. I just wept and wept and wept. Back in Bamming Room, I did the same thing. So the spirit of Jesus, after 2,000 years, could you know turn me upside down. And this is again, I feel that Maharaji's extension of Lila. because how could a person who is from a different religion and a different faith could feel that spirit he has given me permanent feeling 
wherever I go, no matter, it's a graveyard, it's a kabrasthan, it is a, it is a temple, it is a cremation ground, it is a church. I am always at home and with Maharaj. That is all I can say. Anything that you ask me, I am free to open. Please go ahead and ask. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, Namaste. Just ask me anything you want more further. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how you access Maharaji without the body? He's here all around and, and the miracles and the Leela are still happening for you. So how do you tune into that energy? There are, there are two ways to decode it. Number one, you know the Guru, when he meets you and he infuses his grace unto you, what he does, you know, I'll, I'll try to be a little scientific. He infuses a chip inside you the spiritual chip and it depends on the capacity of your past lives the accumulated karmas that what you know capacity of chip he can insert inside you supposing you you talk in terms of gb then you talk in terms of gigabyte megabyte terabyte so that increase the byte is your sadhana your 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 you know your your uh, effort your seva your service to the humanity, your own emotional, uh, you know, surrender to him. And later on, it is that spirit inside you that keeps on increasing the, the volume of it, the density of it, the, the, the power of it. And that spirit, you know, can you say that you have, a, you have a cell phone with you? You can speak with the same cell phone in, in, in uh, let's say, New Mexico or Taos and I can take the same one in New York and I can speak from the same cell, cell phone with that chip at in Paris or in London or in India. That chip inserted is a spiritual chip. It's difficult to understand with any other mythology but Indian spirituality says that Akhand Mandala Akaram He is, the divine is per, per, pervading everywhere. Akhand Mandala Akaram Vyaptam Yeni Sacharacharam He is available in the whole universe. Tatpadam darsitam yeno. Wherever you see that Guru's channel, Tasmai Sri Guru Banamo, I bow to you. He is, our, our Guru is so potent, he is omniscient, he is transcient, he is uh, omnipotent, he is everything. That is, you know, you have a God which you conceive. You conceive that God and you say that he has such, 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 such quality, he has unbearable compassion, he has... Uh, you know, he's, he's worried about every suffering. He can, op, he can remove suffering from his whole life is, you know, like Jesus, you know. He, he turned water into uh, milk. He, you know, did so many miracles. He uh, embraced a leper and cured him. So, that is the spirit which, you know, Jesus said, I and my father are one. You decode that he was son of God, but I decode he told people that look, I am the same divine. My interpretation as a Hindu also would be that Jesus cried out loudly that I and my father are friends, I am the one you are looking out for. Shankaracharya in Hindu philosophy said, I am Brahmashmi. Mansur said, Anal, Anal Haq. So it is up to you how you take your divine. So I, as far as I am concerned, that divinity called Jesus, that divinity called Maharajji, that divinity called whatever, all those realized saints had attained the divine status are the same part of the same. They are continuity. It's, your divine is a continuity. Whenever the divine incarnates in the form of a human being, he has all the strength of a, of a divine with him. All the, 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 all the qualities of a divine with him. Now, the Hindu philosophy is little more, you know, you know, more understanding about it. So it, it goes with an open mind. To me, I have, I'm at home at church, I'm at home at a mosque, I'm at home at a temple. But that is again, I don't say it is my effort, it is my Guru's grace that he had given me that, shown me that oneness. Showing that oneness is real Guru's job. 
So I, I carry him with me all the time. I see here he's present because who is speaking? Who is giving voice to me? Who is making me think? Where is that capacity to think? It is a divine. This is what is my concept divine. <laughs> That's it. Um, can we go back to uh, when when Maharaji was in the body and the Westerners started coming? Um, what was what was that like to have have all these people from the United States? You know, States? Westerners came to Babaji. Actually, it started with Ramdas. Baba Ramdas, when he came in, he was working on drugs, LSDs. But, you know, he was also looking out for an anchor, that, that divine spark. Basically, he was a holy person inside. But he wanted to get that expression that permanently got settled here. So he did with drugs. He could not find that stability. Then he came, you know, he wanted to, you know, kind of experiment with other philosophies. You know, he had been chosen, marked by Maharaji as a, his, uh, you know, emissary for the West. You know, Maharaji wanted to bring his aura, his, I would not call it a flavor, in his, his divinity here, his concept of divinity here, his education of oneness, his education of love, his education of service to mankind, he wanted to bring it here. He chose Ramdas, pulled me all the way from Kathmandu, he met one gentleman, one sadhu, Possibly it was Bhagwan Das or whatever, and then came here. But he was only used as a vehicle to be brought to Kechi. Bhagwan Das's job, whosoever brought him here, was finished. Then Ram Das was picked up by Babaji, and he was totally infused by the same chip I'm telling you about. And then he came here. Then when he had the taste of the divine, he was drunk with spirituality, and he wanted to share with his brothers in US. At that time, probably hippie cult was very prominent. Lots of hippie cult is again, you know, they were also searching the stability. That anchor, they call spirituality, they call bliss, they call freedom, they call so many things. They were intellectuals, they were well-read, they were engineers, they were architects. They had huge potential to become anything. They chose hippism to find out that truth. And Ramdas became a vehicle. And after that, he has done a wonderful job. He came back to again to India, he brought more disciples, there was, uh, you know, I know few of them, Rameshwar Das doing a good job, Paul Singer is doing a good job, Raghu Marcus is doing a good job, Hanuman Das is doing a good job, many, many, I, I, I will not name a few, there are hundreds of these things, clones of Ram Das who are working for him now. I went to, uh, you know, Mavi, I'm coming from there only. I spent four glorious days with Baba Ramdas. I'm the first one who started calling Ramdas Baba because he's a Baba. He has given up everything, he's in my way. And you know, maybe he's sick, he's old, but then, you know, waste above, I found him sparkling with life, sparkling with spirituality. So, whatever is happening in, you are coming here, you are interviewing me, what for? Something turned you on, so that slowly and slowly, you are getting other alternatives also to express your, your, your wish, your, 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 your quest for truth. You know, everyone wants a stability, emotional stability. Money stability is necessary, social stability is necessary, but there's an emotional stability. There's a spiritual ability, which you, is, is, is stability. You are yearning for it. That is called peace, that is called tranquility, that is called bliss, that is called ananda, whatever you want to call it. That is why is you know people with all the wealth are getting nuts. Your your word or just so much of psychiatric help is being sought because there is so much of instability in their emotional Maharaj or any other saint. With your prayers, you do prayers. You they set your emotions right, and all of you are going doing a wonderful job. I wish every American a very good thing and. I'm sure that tomorrow's world is going to be very, very peaceful with all the saints, all the realized beings, the people who are not here but they are in the Himalayas doing penances or anywhere in the world, in the churches, they don't come out, the Dalai Lama, everyone, they are working towards that harmony. 
and the you know they call it universal utopia it will only come when all these forces combine together your emotions my emotions everything then the whole thing becomes one that united whole we started you know i've just written uh, written a three page letter to the american brotherhood maybe it will be put in the you know you know the whole brotherhood when unites the good will has to come the goodness has to come that universal utopia is right now looks like it's not coming but if we make an effort combine effort together we have that you know that oneness you say 14.5 billion years ago uh, uh in uh, the singularity of immeasurable density exploded and it is still expanding you say you know in indian mythology ekoham bhashami lord vishnu says that i am one let me be many and uh, you know thy will be done said the lord or ja ho ja said in muslim uh, mythology or philosophy whatever you call it now all this are you not that singularity is being oneness anyone suffering in ethiopia it should pain me anyone suffering in us in should pain the indian anyone suffering in india should pain this that is only possible when there is a universal consciousness that universal consciousness is very important get it through prayers get it through service get it through anything but once you get that there will be peace all around and then you will know what is real peace what is universal utopia namaste Hey, could you start by telling us your name and uh, when you were with Maharaji? Namaste. I'm R K Joshi. They also call me Rabbu Joshi. That's my family name, my nickname that was given to me by my parents, and we continued. I met first Maharaji, alias Baba Ji. You know, it's all, we 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 call in the hills Maharaj. Maharaj is a big king. is also a allegory given to great saints we call them maharaj so i first met him in the year 1955 when i was 15 years and it was the evening of uh, 1955 month july and i spoke those uh, questions what children ask that as to how would i be in my studies and whether will i get my own uh, you know bicycle that was pride to have a bicycle those days your own bicycle was a pride so well one of those things and after that in 1958 i had gone to nanital to visit the hills and have some fun as a 17 and a half year old kid would like to have i stayed with my uncle who was already a devotee of maharaj ji and he started telling me all tell nice stories about him initially my main interest was to go to the hills go to the place where the crowds were the music band were there the band stand was there have some dance have some fun but then you know per you know obligation to my parents and my uncle i had to also visit uh, that uh, temple where maharaj ji was expected to consecrate a temple of shiva in the year 1958 i went with uncle and he kept on telling me the stories about him we went for the morning aarti we went for the evening aarti and slowly and slowly out of first initially out of sheer courtesy and respect to my elder uncle and also of fear of being deported back to alabad and i slowly started picking up interest and one fine afternoon there was a news that maharaj ji had arrived at the temple so my uncle immediately rushed also hauled me in and everyone was doing the pranam to baba ji so i also bowed my head at his feet and you know kind of came back at a distance then you know he said my uncle said that baba ji he's my nephew rabbu and he kind of just acknowledged and that was that and after that every time i would look at him i would find that he was gazing at me but then the moment our eyes locked he would you know kind of shift his eyes so but then i felt attracted and then i kept on going to him do some work in the temple help uh, you know prasad making 
and everything and then go back to the temple. Uh, go back to Maharaji and then he would look at me, I would always would look and then he would avoid. So you know, first day in the evening people started going back to their house. So I asked my uncle, shall I go? It was in the evening, he said, has he asked you to go? I said, no. He said, stay back. And I stayed overnight, slept with the crowd, the people, the elders. I, I got a place to sleep with a blanket to cover myself. And then again, in the morning, I started working. And again, I went to him. I was, you know, and then I was kind of started loving going to him. And the second evening, but of course, I was also cursing me that all that fun in the hills I'm missing. So three, four times I got down to the road to go out of the premises, but I could not cross the gate from the slope uh, that met the road end, the road, you know, the entry. I just came back again. Third evening, he went to a devotee, his name was Mr. Chandlal Shah, he was ailing. His wife was a great devotee of Maharaji, so she had requested, so Maharaji sat on a palki, palanquin they call it, they carry the uh, person in the back, in, in their back, and then he goes there. So we went there and we reached that hilltop, it was proper Nanital Hill, something near the Ramsey Hospital. And then we had a good feast because he was a very well-to-do, wealthy man. So we got a good feed and I also had a good, good, good food. And then fell sleepy and went to the drawing room and found it was the thick rugs that usually, you know, is put in the hills. So I tucked my feet inside the sofa set and coiled myself and went to sleep. So in the morning, the elderly ladies, we call them mice, mothers, they started doing his arti, so I was also woken up. Well, I got up, they were waving Aarti, someone gave uh, Aarti in my hand and I also waved. And then kept it, uh, you know, sat down at a distance of five, six feet. So Maharaji called me, come here. And then he said that this boy says that neither he's talking to me nor he's giving me any things and he patted me. Here, just like that. And something inside me just broke down and I wept unashamedly, not loud, but the tears were fast trickling down. And that pat had given me all the incantations ever made in any temple, any church, any mosque, any mantra that has ever been sung or spoken or any mantra which has been written, the Vedas, the Upanishads, everything was embedded in the chip that he planted inside me. And after that, there has been no coming back, no thinking of any other God, no duality. And I have been a constant companion. Rather, Maharaj B has been my constant companion. He has guided me through, through thick and thins of life. He has totally remodeled my life. And today, uh, well, I'm back to Taos again for the second time. And I have the fortune of assisting Baba Ramdas, Dr. Richard Elbert, in you know, making that murti of Hanuman. And we got it painted and shipped to U.S. It has been put in Taos temple and there with all his majestic posture, Hanuman is waiting for a new temple. This time I came especially to plead all my brothers of America to please put their all might and soul in making this temple come true, which will be a dream come true for the people of Taos. It will be a good temple, an ascetic temple. I've seen the drawings, they are wonderful. And I also pledge today that I, 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 I give all my services, mental, physical, whatever. And that is it. And I would like you to go ahead with the temple. And Siddhima this time, and before I came in here, I went to Siddhima, you all know her as the mother of Kenchi. I went to her and I told her, Ma, I would like to get this temple get going, shall I go and ask people? She categorically said yes. And whenever anyone went, whether it was Paul Singer or it is uh, Raghu Markas or it is Rameshwar Das or it is Hanuman Das, anyone that when mother said that you must make a temple for Hanuman and but that is it. And I wish the temple is made as soon as possible. I visit again Taos and make my life successful. Thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit about the um, the miracles or the Leela and 
the ordinary nature of it all for a saint or when you're in the presence of greatness? Well, in that context, my whole life has been a witness to all those incredible leelas. You know, you don't call them miracle because when a realized being, wherever walks, whatever he does, it flows out of his inner nature. They call it Prakriti. One day, Maharaji told my uncle, Puran, I do not do anything. I do not do anything. It is the nature, it's Prakriti that does all the thing for me. So that is what it is when you have all the powers at your command. They are eager to help you out. You know, uh, Sage Maharshi Arvind once said that the supramental being does not do anything. All the natural forces of the universe help him make do things. That is what Maharaji was and is doing all the time. It is an incessant play of his leelas, which I am a personal witness and, well, I have faced him over and over and over again in my life. They have come to me, choosing my career, choosing my... Uh, even he chose a wife for me, you know. When I was started working, I was... Well, I was an average job, so... My mother was after me that you are 29, 30 now and get married. So I personally went to Allahabad to tell that, look, I don't want to get married now, I can't support. So in comes Maharaji to our house directly with the mothers and tells me that, say yes. I said, Maharaji, I cannot support. I am weak in finance. He said, who are you to support? Only God does support. You are no one. Say yes, and I have held this girl for you for the last four years. I would not let her marry anyone else. So, <laughs> when I got married, and my wife, you know what he told me, that look, she had gone to see Maharaji four years ago. She had not known Maharaji, but she went to meet an aunt of hers, who was, you know, she was Mrs. Kamala Pandey. So she went to see her, and she, she took her to Maharaji in the room, and Maharaji said, you are my daughter. And she says that after that, she, you know, her family tried to get her married many, many places. But when she was my ma Maharaj has chosen her for me. And there I am, a married man with that woman. And when, you know, we were talking of miracles, or talking of Leelas, when I had settled my marriage, the marriage was settled for 8th March 1970. So I had booked my, you know, there was no direct train to Meerut, which is a town about 480, 500 kilometers away from Allahabad, where from my marriage party was to start. So he said, how are you going? I said, we are going by bus. He said, no, you don't go. There will be an accident, you will all die. I said, but sir, I have already booked a bus and there is no direct train and I can't put all those marriage party members into trouble. How can I take them? So I married, arranged a deluxe bus. He said, no, you don't. Then when I, I was also, you know, I, I became adamant. Then he told me, okay, then you don't go on the 7th as you are planning. You go on the 6th, two days early. And he changed my route and made me go through Lucknow, which was almost a division of 100 plus kilometers, even a little more. So he said, I said, what do I do? Uh, if I don't get a place for the marriage to stay at Lucknow, party to stay at Lucknow? He said, no, you will get it. And he forcibly sent me. And I went, luckily I got, why luckily it was all his preordained, I got a whole floor in a dharamshala, then you, what you call here motels. It was something like that, but you don't have to pay. You just give it as a charity, whatever money you want to give. And I got my arrangement, a whole first floor, I got it for myself. And we started on the 6th March uh, at about 1.50. And after almost about 70, 80 kilometers, there's a place called Raibareli, could be even more than that. The bus lost its balance and it turned three times and it turned turtle and not exactly turtle but it went sideways and all the glasses and mirrors they just broke and shattered in and the driver's window became a getaway door. So all of us came out and I was very very you know thoughtful about it that how many people have you know kind of uh, died. So I asked my uncle Mukanda that uh, check how many people so they were, we were too short. So myself and him went in, we found our cousin, he had a little back pain and injury. 
he, we pulled him out and then there was one girl, Mukta, my cousin's sister. So we pulled her out, she was stuck inside a trunk, you know, between a trunk and a seat. And she was harmless, she was smiling, we pulled her out. That Mukta Joshi, after almost about 46 years, is residing in Princeton, New Jersey and very happily married with one daughter. So this is what it is and uh, well, we went to, to Lucknow and after that all the transporters dumped us. They would not take an unlucky Baraz who met with an accident. Then we went by train from Lucknow to Meerut, got married, changed the train again, came back by another train. My father somehow other managed to push us into a, you know, we managed to arrange a compartment for us. So all of us came in and when we reached Allahabad on the 10th of March, I found that Maharaj's jeep was waiting for me and he was very excited saying that my son is coming, my daughter-in-law is coming, my daughter is coming and then the elders said that no, let's go to the house first with the bride. I said no, I'm going to the uh, DT which saved my life. So when I went there, I was with my wife, I got down from the jeep, he had sent for me and opened the gate of Mr. Mukherjee's house. My tears started welling up in me and fell down at his feet and cried. So my wife thought that she had married a crybaby. <laughs> it's very funny. Then you know, meanwhile, on the seventh, my mother was told, this is an in-between interlude, that there was an accident of her son's marriage and they do not know what how many casualties. So on the seventh morning, she went to Bharachi and he had disappeared the earlier, the earlier evening, he had gone to some other place and the house, Mr. Mukherjee's house was without Maharaj. So she went to Siddhima, who was staying in a nearby uh, house and she told all her woes and she kind of lamented. So Siddhima said, look, uh, with Maharaj around nothing will happen, we will pray for also. And then she left the prashad she had taken from Maharaji. So as you know, my mother came back, to some extent consoled by the Siddhi, controlled by Siddhima, there's a very sweet sound, a very elderly sound came from down below that I am very hungry, can someone can give me food? So Siddhima heard it and she sent the prasad for... <laughs> I'm getting emotional because I'm talking about my Lord. So she sent the prasad and when the sadhu ate, he very sweetly cooed that whosoever has given me the prasad, nothing bad will come to him. So, by the time Siddhima could get alert, she sent the, you know, her sevak down to find him out. He had disappeared. And that is why my mother said, challengingly, that, look, nothing has happened. Go ahead and celebrate. So this is how about it. And when I, 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 I was crying at the feet of Maharaji, so he gave my wife a box of sweets and a red sari. Now that red sari she started wearing and she also started having some, you know, quite a lot of faith on Maharaji. Then as she was doing some work, she cut the end of the little sari and then she said, I'll wear it when I deliver my first child. And when my wife went to deliver the first child, she wore that sari. She delivered a child, which was done with a lot of, probably carelessness of the doctors and all. There was a lot of problem and then she went into a, a coma stage. She was succumbing. A doctor comes in, she says, sister, oxygen tent, sister, racodron. And anyway, she was revived. And after three days, she told me that as she was, as she was sinking in, she found Maharaji laughing in front of the bed. So this is how he totally programs your life and takes you all through thick and thin of life. My life is full of his lila. If I start telling it, you know, it will take probably hours and hours and I'll keep on weeping and, you know, kind of in front of you. But then I have written a book where I have recorded all his leelas. In English it is known as I and my father are one. And the second is in Hindi, Soi Jani Ye Dehu Janai. These books record that how a divine incarnate, I am using my word very carefully, a divine incarnate is the continuation of divinity. You know, I personally feel that divine is the three-dimensional representation in the world to help people, to relieve people of their miseries, to help the poor, keep, you know, to share the miseries and then ultimately give them a deliverance by, you know, inspiring them to do good deeds and then they become 
Later on, they continue the chain of being this. Thing. So, to, uh, for me, Maharaj is a divine incarnate. They say he is Hanuman avatar. They say he is Vishnu. Someone say that he is Brahma. I said he is all combined into one, the divine personified. You know, in Sanskrit, there is a saying says, Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo Maheshwara. Guru Sakshat Param Brahma. Tasma Ishi Guru Enamo. You, you, he is the holy trinity of, uh, you know, divine. And all good qualities, the omniscience, the omnipotence, the omnipresence, all are his qualities which he only uses it for the welfare of the mankind and, and keeps on uh, getting born over and over again. Once he is Jesus, once he is Maharaji, once he is Ramkish Paramahans. But that depends on what is your concept of divine, you know. Some fundamentalists may not agree, some people may say that, no, this is not correct, but this is what I believe and I am trying to share this with you. Can you talk to us a little bit about how um, Maharaji influences your daily life and the decisions that you make and the interactions you have with people? Well, uh, he's a very integral part of my life. I carry him inside me. And you know, when I do anything, I don't hesitate to pick up the alternative which is suitable to me. You know, if you talk in terms of duality, duality is seeing two, having two alternatives. Uh, first alternative, whether I do this or do that, if I study, whether I take this subject, that subject, if I take a, you know, path, do I take this path or that path? So that when he is, he, he, he gives you his grace, then you don't hesitate in choosing your options. Supposing if I am saying that I am coming to Taos from India, so whether I go to Taos or not, no. I go to Taos, I pick up the first alternative. So that is one he has given me ever since he patted me here. And I have never had two thoughts about my approach to life. If I want to do a thing, it takes me one moment. And as far as his uh, uh, presence with me is concerned, there is not a single moment which I pass, which, well, there is a subconscious, there is an unconscious, there is a conscious mind, but he always is here in my sub subconscious. And all my decisions, even the food I eat or even whatever I do, I don't say that it's all the time remembering him and chanting his name and all, no. Because I am a householder, I am a business uh, executive, I keep my this thing, then I go to the ashram, I take decisions which concern the ashrams of my social life, my emotional life, my family life. So, but then there is nothing that I fear in doing because I know that he is in spirit all the time with me. Uh, and I also know that he always watches me. I'll give you a very, you know, it's a very cute example. You know, when I was young, I was a bachelor and a happy-go-lucky bachelor that way. I was earning money, so my neighbors were a couple of boys who were doing their medical. And they had come from Bombay to study. I was in Jamshedpur, it's in eastern India. So we would play, play cards in the night. And you know, kind of take a pack and on Saturday night we would play little money on sticks. Not a gambling, but then you know, for fun. And we would play for the whole night and at about 10 in the afternoon or 12 in the, 10 in the morning or 12 in the afternoon, we'd wind up in there. So what I would do is when the game would start in my room, I was a, I was, I was a bachelor's bed, so I would turn his photograph facing the wall. So my friends would say, hey, what are you doing? I said, well, I don't want him to watch me. So he said, where is he? I said, he could be 1500 kilometers, but as far as I'm concerned, he's watching me right now. He said, how is it possible? I said, you don't know it, but I know what, <laughs> how he watches me. He said, after four, five, six months, I went on a, you know, on a vacation to my place, Allahabad, where my parents were staying. So Maharaj, he was also, you know, he had come to Allahabad. So I went to see him and, you know, he was, you know, was kind of pressing his feet. So it is an Indian custom to, you know, pay your respect to the elders or the, the dear ones and the, uh, you know, the beloved ones. As I was pressing his feet, 
So I thought in my mind that, do you know what your son does when you don't, uh, when he's away from you? He was talking to someone, immediately turned his uh, you know, attention toward me. You think I don't know it? I know everything about you. So that is a kind of an example that there is not a single moment he doesn't watch me. And uh, well, I have his friends all the time with me. Very inspiring, very con confirmatory. And when I do something, I do it in his name. And I'll, I'll give you an uh, example. My daughter was getting married uh, about 15, 17 years ago. So I had a, you know, open bhandara on the 9th that she was to be married on 26th January. And on 19th January, I opened uh, the kitchen and told my brother that anyone who comes to the house of any status, he should not go without eating food. That is the way Maharajji's uh, systems operate. So on that wedding day, there was something around five, six hundred people were eating. And my brothers, my cousin brother said that, look, Maharajji might come and eat food. Just watch. I said, stupid, who is eating from these 600 mouths? So, you know, bin pake chalai sunai bin kana. He walks without feet, he hears without ears. That is what is divine. And that is how Maharaji has always been in my life. So, I am inspired by every, my every action is inspired by him. I have come here, I have just come to just hang around and I have no business for 40 days. I have gone all around the US. I went to New Jersey, went to Long Island, went to San Francisco, went to Hawaii to be with Baba Ramdas, to be with, you know, uh, here with the Satsang. I go to Massachusetts, I go to Chicago. So, uh, who is driving me there? Who is giving me all those, that inspiration, the energy at the age of 76 that I'm coming here? I'm still, you know, I'm talking and I just walked out, went to so many places, did my part in the morning. So. He's the one who, who, who you are plugged to and he's probably a billion dollar, a billion voltage connection that you get. Anything else to do? Please ask. Please. In, times, in times of sorrow, um, how, how does your faith help you? You've surely cared for many people who've passed away and, and how do you feel in those times? given your faith is so strong. I'll give you an example. When I was married, prior to that, Maharaj had asked me to do certain things. Like said, sending 500 rupees to a certain person. I did send a check, but the friend made a check with the draft in the name of that particular person I wanted to send the money, but sent it, dispatched it in my name. So the person did not get the money. And when I came back, I told him, did you send the money? He said, I did, but then it has come back because you're not delivered. So, well, I lost that money in some card game or something. <laughs> I must be seeming very bad, but I'm very frank about it. So, when I lost that money, then Maharaj met me after two months. He asked me, did you send the money? So, I very, you know, I hung my head in shame and said, I had sent the money technically, but then some other... It got waylaid and that's it. Then he said, oh, had you given the money, probably your financial problems would have been over. So I got married and all hell broke loose. I got, I had met with an accident. I broke, I mean, I kind of dislocated my spinal cord. I was in bed for six, seven months. It all happened slowly and the problem started getting me. So, you know, there's a bad phase of, phase of Saturn. So my mother-in-law showed the horoscope to a astrologer. He said that I have two very bad phases of Saturn and they are very dangerous so I should do some kind of a part. Part is, you know, it's like known as they call it Mahamatunja Jab, that, that cast away the death threat by the, by the, by the stars. So when my mother-in-law asked me that, a Pandit has asked me to do this, shall I do it? I said, I have only one person who takes care of my life. If he wants it, anyone can take me away. But if he doesn't want it, anyone who comes with any this thing, he just can't touch me. So that is the kind of, uh, you know, I have faith on him. And uh, my mother was a very close uh, devotee of Maharaj Ji. 
She died on a certain date which was predestined 30 years ago by Maharaj uh, My father died, he died a very brave person, he was known as Hemda. But I have just seen them going to the fraternity of his old bhaktas who had died and they are living with him. This is a very, you know, strong Hindu faith that once you are blessed by a saint, it is his guarantee to take you to the stars and the moons. And even if you are born, you are born again to do his seva. As far as I am concerned, I want my birth over and over again, but in one condition, that I must serve him wherever he is. Him and Mataji, to me, Siddhi Ma is a continuation of Maharaji. And I want them to be, I, mean, I don't want any liberation, I don't want any salvation, I don't want any moksha or whatever you call it, or the heavens. I want to be born over and over again and be at his service. If that is the faith you call it, yes, I have that. Very, very firmly. Thank you. Um, are there any other teachings um, from Mother that you want to share with us? You know, Mother is the most, your yeah, Hanuman is the most humble servant of Ram. So Mother is the most humble servant of Maharaji. Even she is capable of granting you wishes, even she is capable of salvaging you from all the ills that befall in the physical life. She always delegates, delegates it to Maharaji. I am not to see, yet to hear Mother saying that I have done it. She always says, if, even if you go to her and ask for a boon, she would say either go to Hanumanji and ask, or she would say, ask Maharaji. So, this is the, you know, humility of a devotee. So, in, you know, Ram and Hanuman are two examples of master and the servant. So, Hanuman is so devoted to Ram that he does not, though he is he has immense power, he is immensely intelligent. You know, in Sanskrit there is a shlok, Atulit Bal Hamam Swarna Shailaba Deham, Danujvan Krishanam Gyanya Nam Bagarganam, Sakal Gundanam Barana Nam Dicham, Ragbat Pri Bhaktam Bhadjatam. He is taught, he is intelligent, he is powerful, he is mighty, he is resourceful, he can do many, many things. But then he always dedicates whatever he has done when he came and burned the Lanka, he came to Ram and said, I have not done, Prabhu, it is because of your might I was able to do it. That is what Mother is to Maharaji. And Ram, you know, ultimately makes Hanuman so powerful, he, you know, kind of enfolds him into him. So much so that he becomes Ram himself. But till Hanuman, that particular phase of Hanuman is under, you know, uh, his uh, seva his service. So he always dedicates it to Ram. And then, you know, it's a continuous chain. Ram and Hanuman is a continuous chain of master and sevak, disciple, servant. And that keeps on rolling. Today's Hanuman is tomorrow's Ram. That is what is my concept of divine, which keeps on getting incarnated. He creates, he teaches, he perfects a person, makes him perfect to keep, take, take, keep on taking the chain of on and on and on of good work being continued. I think that's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Good that it got washed off yesterday. Yeah. <laughs>